Hi everyone, I'm Josh. I'm one of the pastors at Mosaic. I hope you had a great Christmas and that you're enjoying your Sabbath Sunday. It's been our practice over the last four years to take the last Sunday of every year and observe it as a Sabbath Sunday, which means we don't have an in-person worship gathering. Instead, we have a teaching that's available to people at home. It's a gift back to our volunteer teams who have worked so hard throughout the year. And it's an opportunity for us to enter the next year, the new year, from a place of resting with God. So I hope you're enjoying that. And to all of our, uh, of our volunteers, I want to say a heartfelt thank you from our staff and our elders at Mosaic. We love you so much and appreciate everything that you do. So today, I wanna to talk about Sabbath rest. I recently came across a quote from Scottish author and minister George MacDonald, who was kind of a spiritual father to C.S. Lewis in many, many ways. He said this, he says, certainly work is not always required of a man. There is such a thing as a sacred idleness, the cultivation of which is now fearfully neglected. So when you hear that, when you hear about a sacred idleness, what, what does that feel like to you? I know for me, when I think about it, um, when, when I think about uh, an idleness that, that's possibly sacred, uh, just time off, uh, downtime, it really is a push against our culture in our time and in our age. Uh, it's against that, uh, push against that the, the hustle mindset that says you're always doing something, you should always be producing something, everyone should have a side hustle that they're trying to figure out how to monetize. People want to know about the ROI, you know, the, the, the return on investment of how you're spending your time and your attention. Um, it's a push against um, those that, that even talk about how um, downtime or recreation or having a hobby or even taking a nap it comes from a place of privilege comes from a place of having a certain amount of wealth that you can actually afford to have a hobby or uh, spend time and and money doing something that you enjoy outside of work uh, so it's a push against uh, some mindsets in our culture and and yet I think there's really something of value here and that we need to ask our, ourselves the question uh, just because someone doesn't have uh, time or money to put into a hobby or doesn't have you know the the uh, uh, availability to do that does that mean everyone shouldn't uh, have a, a hobby or some downtime that they should enjoy how's that working for us being a part of a whole hustle culture or, or the gig economy where every everybody has a side gig how's that actually working for us mentally and emotionally. And, and I don't think I need to quote the statistics to you about burnout in the workplace or our mental health uh, and wellness. We actually did a series on that here uh, a month or so ago, and, and we don't need to requote the stats on, on how far that has fallen in, in the recent decades. I want you to think back um, actually about the last few weeks. Think about Christmas for you. Think about all the, uh, the, the ways that you enjoyed and looked forward to Christmas, but also think about all the things leading up to it. Think about the rush and the busyness and all the tasks that you had to get done and all the people that you had to talk, talk to. I, I know most people in our culture, whether they have grown up in the church or are part of church or not at all, nothing in particular maybe that they would consider in themselves, most people in our culture still look forward to celebrating Christmas in some form or fashion, and yet there usually comes a downside because of all the hurry, because of all the bustle, because of all the things and all the stress that it, it brings into our lives. And so when I think back over the years of being a part of uh, Christmas celebrations and my family and then in my extended family and in my, uh, through my in-laws, I think there's usually about three areas that I can think of that have brought up stress, have th brought up tensions. Uh, first, there's relational dissonance that you may or may not have experienced yourselves, but I think you can probably relate to that. There's relational dis dissonance. You haven't quite resolved that thing with your sister or your brother, or, you know, politics came up again in conversation, or there's always that one crazy uncle that we all have. Uh, second, there's unmet expectations. Someone wanted a gift they didn't get. You had to say no to something or someone when you really wanted to say yes. There's just, just these accumulating unmet expectations. And then finally, 
Uh, there's limiting factors. There, there's too many gifts with too little money. There's too many things to do with too little time. Maybe there's too much good food with too little bandwidth in your nutritional goals to fit it all in. So there's, there's limitations that we run into over the holiday season. So I know you could, you could add to that list. You might take a couple of those things off. But I think we can relate at least to those three of being the things that, that, that come and, and bring stressors and bring tension and really rob us of our peace and rob us of our rest during Christmas time. And we usually look for ways to cope. We actually might just blow through our budget, might just blow through our, our nutritional goals and overeat or overdrink. It, it may be that we'd blow up and or, or maybe like triangulate or gossip or do something that, to get back at the sibling or the parent or whoever. I mean, not you guys, someone else in someone other's family, I know. But we do things that we're, where we look for comfort and ways to cope when we're overstressed and we're looking for peace and we're looking for rest that's quite elusive. So I, I want to talk about the rest that God actually offers to us. And so I know in a lot of ways that this isn't going to be a new teaching for many of us. It's in some ways going to be a reminder of the ever standing invitation from God to come find our rest and find our peace in him. Whether you've screwed up for the fifth time or the 50th time, God is still offering peace and rest so that you could find it in him. In fact, since the beginning, God has been inviting his people into rest. God never meant it that we would be caught up in a, a hustle mentality or uh, spending too many waking hours, doing too many things with too little sleep, always feeling like there's more to do on our to-do list, always feel, feeling like we're behind and that ever elusive goal of peace and of rest. God meant it so that we could be with him enjoy him enjoy each other in a fulfillment and a fullness of peace and of rest and so god set from the beginning in the garden adam and eve in the garden to tend it and it wasn't toil it wasn't it was labor but it wasn't laborious right it, it was work but it was good work that was creative and beautiful and, and bettered the world. God had that in mind. And yet, because of, of sin, because of the fall, that was, that, that was broken and evil entered the, the world. Our, our labor then soon started to define us. It soon, soon became uh, toil. We had uh, back-breaking work to do uh, and, and so on and so forth. You know the cycle of that. But God created a people, and called out a people, known as the Israelites, and they were kept in bondage in Egypt, and yet God still wanted and invited them to come and find their rest in him, to come and find their fulfillment, not in what they do, but in who they are as his special treasure, as his special people. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 5, after the exodus, after they've, they've exited Egypt, it says this, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your female or uh, male or female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So there are two main Hebrew words. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language. There are two main words for rest in the Old Testament. We see them both here in this section in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The first is Shabbat, which is translated Sabbath. It's, it's our uh, commonly used word for Sabbath. God commanded that the nation of Israel to portion off a 24-hour period where they were to cease from their labor and their activities and they would worship and they would connect with each other in the community. Their old way of life as slaves in Egypt required that they would work uh, every day. They would do back-breaking work for little gain 
every day and they would have no rest and no time to worship God. So God wanted to purge that mentality from them and remind them that he was their protector and he was their provider. Now the second word after Sabbath, the second word for rest, is nuach, which means to settle or to dwell. We see that here and again in this, this section of scripture where it says that the, the servants are to rest as you do. So there's Sabbath and there's nuach there for, for everyone in the community resting and worshiping and being with God. God's desire uh, is for his people to be set apart and to connect and to relate to both him and each other. So this, this word for rest has connotations of being settled in or uh, 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 being be a dwelling among. And so it's very connectional, very relational because God is a relational God. And so we see the fullest expression of this in the person and in the work of Jesus. In the first uh, chapter of the Gospel of John, it says the, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So, so actually, the, that fulfillment of God dwelling with his people that he first did in the garden, he did again in the person of Jesus, and he'll do again in the new heavens and in the new earth. And so we actually see in the incarnation, this dwelling among, this God being with his people, this idea of Sabbath and rest is a very Advent-centered idea. The, this, the whole reason that we celebrate Christmas, Christmas is the coming of Jesus, dwelling with his people. So we, ha- we see how God has connected these themes actually throughout all of the scripture. And so thinking back to Moses, the context in which the commandment was given to observe the Sabbath is really important here. The nation of, of Israel in Deuteronomy, which we, we, we read, they had just been delivered in the Exodus from Egypt through a tremendous show of God's power through the ten plagues. And when we look at the escalation of the plagues of Egypt, we see Pharaoh and his false gods destabilized and dethroned so that the Israelites could go freely out into the wilderness and worship God, worship Yahweh. Each of the idols of the Egyptians was confronted and then humiliated and exposed, and the nation of Israel The now freed slaves could go on their way and worship God as he commanded and invited them to do so. So for us today, mentioning idols uh, conjures up pictures in our mind a lot of times of statues and prostrated people in front of them. So it's it's not easy to think about like the idols that may be in our lives. But we all have trust structures. We have things that we trust in that we sometimes have to check in on before we worship God. An idol or a trust structure is anything you have to get permission from before you worship God. And there are all kinds of things that that we have built up in our lives that we trust in. And so God is in the business of humbling those trust structures so that we can actually be free and worship him freely in the the freedom and the spirit of, of truth to know who he is and know that he wants to be connected uh, to us in a deep, deep way. And so think about, think about those three things that I mentioned earlier that be, bring stress and tension into Christmas time celebrations. Um, the relational dissonance, the unmet expectations, and the limiting factors. What we can do is we can pull at the thread of why do we let those things rob us of our peace? Why do those things get in the way, create dissonance, They create anxiety in our relationships, both with other people, within our own selves, for sure, and then with God. By pulling at those threads and asking, what is sitting behind that, perhaps? What is it that I'm trusting in more than God's peace and his rest? That that, that's not in my environment, that I I worship God and I believe in God, but I'm not seeing him move. I'm I'm not trusting in him to resolve these different things that I'm experiencing. Maybe it's an overfunctioning uh, self, like in your own heart, that you're a peacemaker and you're trying to keep the peace all around you so that you make sure that no one gets mad at each other. And so you're always playing referee. You're always in the middle. You're always the go-between. And it's exhausting because you just want everybody to be happy. It could be trying to live up to an image or a standard of living that your siblings or your parents or your neighbors all have and you want to be seen equal to them. You, you want to be 
seen in their eyes as good enough, maybe pulling at that thread, exposes that, that you're, you're insecure about who you are or what God has given you or what your job is or who your family is. And, and God is actually wanting to bring peace and rest to that place of insecurity in your life. Whatever it is, God is asking you to step aside from all of that and spend time with him in his presence. You don't have to do anything special to prove to him who you are. You don't owe him anything. All he wants is the yes in your heart. And so God has created and invited you into a, a, a time of rest. We call that the Sabbath. We call that a period of time where you can be with God in his presence. You can dwell with him and he can dwell with you. He can speak to you. You can speak back to him. He can uncover some of those deeper issues in your heart and you can go before him without shame to have those things resolved. That's what he has in mind for you for, for resting and dwelling with him on the Sabbath. Jesus actually said in Matthew 11, he said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites you to take on his burden, which is light, and he's with you, yoked to you, connected to you every step of the way to carry that. That's what he has in mind. So practicing Sabbath rest is as simple as stopping what you're doing and inviting God to fill you in a greater measure. And there's no condemnation for anyone who turns out is really terrible at doing any of that. Stopping, resting, inviting God in. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. We all just should start where we are. We should start with one step towards God and we ask him to give us grace for more. So for you, I invite you to just simply start where you are. And so here's some ideas. And the idea isn't to, to do these all at once, like January, here it's coming. I'm going to do Sabbath perfectly. No, start where you are. And if where you are is a little bit further along than someone else you know or your spouse, that's fine. There's no shame. There's no condemnation for everyone. So it may be for you that you start with a full night's sleep. And that's, that's quite a stretch for some people who are maybe used to five or six hours of sleep. Maybe for you it's seven eight hour, uh, or eight hours of sleep on a night. It may be that you need to just begin there. And uh, maybe have a wind down hour, in fact, before you go to sleep without screens or devices. It's you uh, praying maybe, maybe reading a, a, a bound book, something like that, where you get your, your eyes off a screen and you actually let your mind start to wind down. What would it look like to, to imagine a, a month's worth of nights full of seven to eight hours worth of sleep? What would that do for your mood and your mental health? Another idea is setting aside time each week for a Sabbath. And it may be that you need to begin with six to 12 hours. Something like that, where maybe 24 hours, you just can't quite do that with your job or with school or with family needs or with whatever else you have going on. Maybe it's six hours one day. Maybe it's 12 hours. Um, and you, you, you invite friends over. You eat good food together. Read a good book. Meditate on scripture. Spend some time in prayer. Take a nap, just like Jesus did. I want to give you the permission to be leisurely sacred idleness during those six, 12, whatever it is, however many hours it is. And then when you're able, take a 24-hour Sabbath. Set time apart for 24 hours. You know, like there's no legalism here. If you do 23 and a half hours, like God still counts it. He's so gracious like that. But try for 24 hours. Maybe try to do it once a week for a month, four straight weeks. And again, you don't have to be a legalistic, but do protect that time. Turn your devices off in as much as you can. Put them in a drawer. Put them away. Do something like that. For us at the Ciders House, we begin on Friday evening at 6 p.m. And we go to Saturday 6 p.m. Because my brain tends to start turning on about 6 or 7 on Saturday night for church on Sunday. So I know for me, 24 hours on Saturday just isn't going to work. So we've adapted. And we've adopted the, the sundown to sundown-ish um, of, of Friday night to Saturday night. For us, 
Uh, on Friday night, it's pizza night for the boys. They love pizza. Uh, that's the one night a week they know they're going to get pizza. Sarah and I may go out on a date. Uh, sometimes we, we watch a movie together as a big family. Um, then we sleep in as late as we feel like, as late as we're able to. And, and uh, we wake up, roll out of bed, and then usually I sit on my couch with a book, and I'm there off and on all day, napping, snoozing, doing whatever. Um, we have brunch together, usually pancakes, eggs, waffles, bacon, and something my wife calls a Dutch baby. It's delicious. It's fantastic. Lots of coffee, lots of books for me. Whatever recharges you, it might be a hike, it might be a walk around the block, it might be more meditation of scripture. Whatever that is, do it. Do it. Whatever recharges you, whatever refills you, um, that's it, it. the Sabbath is permission giving. It's a big no to the busyness of life, but it's a big yes to God and to what recharges you as a person and makes you more yourself. So what about you? I wonder, I wonder in 2024, what would it look like for a life-giving rhythm of rest to be put in place in your life? That's what you can do this week. Just, just ponder that as the calendar changes over to the next year. What would starting from a place of rest and continuing throughout the, the year in a place of rest in God look like for you? Because I'll tell you what, we can't predict what happens in 2024. I know there's a tendency to say, this is going to be so much better than last year. This is the best year ever. And I just want to invite you to not put your hope in an external locus of control. But what you can do is be grounded and rested in God. So that whatever storm life brings your way, you're able to weather it. Because you're rested. And you are who God's created you to be. Fully yourself grounded in him. So again, happy new year. Thanks again for tuning in today. And I look forward to seeing you all again real soon.